All right, folks, it's Larry of Packmaster's Dog Training. Let's continue with just talking about dog training. This is part two. So I forget exactly where we left off there, but let's talk about what else I do with my dogs when they're young puppies. <clears throat> we talk about socialization, and I think there's a lot of confusion here with people. When we talk socialization, I think a lot of people think you need as many people and dogs messing and playing with your puppies as possible. I don't really do that. When my dogs are young, I do take them a lot of different places, okay, a lot. I like to expose them to a lot of things, especially between 8 and 16 weeks old. That's a very, very important period. With that being said, you know, at that age, they very rarely play with other dogs or have contact with other dogs. I don't let people fuss all over them and touch them and, and do all kinds of stupid shit in their face because you take a, a big risk at someone doing stupid and causing a problem. So I just want my dogs to be neutral to everything. That is it. So I do take them to a lot of places, but I, I don't I don't throw them in the fire for, for where someone can do something stupid. All right. But again, it's just having the dog with you. You know, when Luca was nine weeks old, we had him one week. We had to travel to a swim meet with Sophia. And it was, you know, we had to go away and we had to stay in a hotel with a nine week old puppy. And we were two days straight for 10, 12 hours a day, whatever it was, outside in, in a swim meet with hundreds of people around. So Luca got a ton of exposure to a lot of things very fast. He was exposed to a lot of people. I made sure he was around a lot of kids. And, you know, that became second nature to him. That's that's very, very important. Um, back to training. Talked about Bruno and we talked about uh, my other dog was Ben. He was our first dog, you know, and um, there was no obedience training. But yet they were the best behaved dogs you've ever seen. It was all done by the rules and structure we create in the house when there are puppies. Because believe me, Bruno was the worst puppy I've ever had in my life. He was an absolute animal. He was a savage. He was a monster. He was horrible. So we had to contain him a lot in so many situations. Okay. And like I said, there was no obedience training. There was no food training back then. Okay. We'll talk about Luca. When Luca was a puppy... He, he, I did do a lot of food training. So all the positions, all the cool things that you see Luca do, everything was taught with food, luring and marking and repetitions when he was young. So everything he knows today, he almost knew everything by the time he was four months old. And you can go back and watch I made my first video with Luca when he was nine weeks old. It was all food and toy related. All right. So... I've never taken Luca on a lot of walks because I don't have that kind of time anymore. But what I did with Luca quite a bit when I wasn't trying to teach behaviors with food, he had a, a little toy, a little wubby, you know, a little mini one. And I just played fetch with him nonstop. I threw that and he brought it back. I threw it and brought it back. That was a big part of his training because he loved to chase so much that I started incorporating that into training. Okay, so besides food, he was toy crazy, more toy crazy. So you use that. All right, guys. And the issue I see today, everyone does the same stuff when it comes to the actual training. Everyone does the same exact stuff. You see the same luring and marking and commands, but yet people expect to get better results. How? How? You have to do something different. You just have to, you know, so... And, and everything is so, it's like a dictatorship, you know, I'll see people, they'll throw a toy for the dog, and if the dog doesn't come straight to them in a direct line, you know, they're lighting them up with an e-collar. Let me tell you something, when I play fetch with Luca, unless I need him to or tell him to, when he's running back, he never runs straight to me, he runs around in big circles, that's part of the reward, that's what he likes to do, so if he likes to do that, I'm going to let him do that. But people are so caught up in controlling every single aspect of their dog when they're training commands. But yet inside the home, they control nothing. Completely opposite. Completely opposite. Okay. Um, let's go a little further. Uh, I don't even know where to go here. Okay. We'll talk about, I've always had male dogs. At one time, we had four dogs. Never had a dog fight. Ever. Never in my life have I had a dog fight. All my dogs are intact now. We've never had a scuffle, okay? Dogs fight when they think they have to. 
all right, when there's no one in charge of the home. They have to. Someone's got to take that role. So when I hear people say, you know, people ask me all the time, well, what, what dog's the dominant one? The dominant one? There is no dominant one. There can't be. If there's a dominant dog, you're going to have problems because eventually someone else is going to want to take that role. There is no dominant dog. They're all the same. They're all number two. I'm in charge. My wife is in charge. Both my kids are in charge, okay? You have to have that to have peace in the house, guys, okay? We'll never have a dog fight because the dogs don't even like that. Um, the German Shepherd we had that died a few years ago, he was my dad's dog, okay? My dad was dying from lung cancer. The dog was five years old. He had a lot of issues. He was pretty damn dog aggressive too. And when my dad was dying, I promised him we would take the dog. I've talked about this. When my dad died. We went up there. We took the dog. We came home. We got three other dogs in the house. Guess what? We have a very big, powerful, dog-aggressive German Shepherd coming in our home. I'm not going to keep him separate. He's going to come in the home day one, and he's going to follow the rules. So what I did at this point was I pulled into the driveway. I got him out. I believe he was on a choke, choke collar at that time. That's what my dad had on him, so it, it, the tool didn't matter to me. I got him out. I walked him a little bit away from my house. I told my wife, okay, go ahead, let the dogs out. And as I started walking, I was walking, constant movement. Three dogs came over, said hello, and he erupted. He tried to get to him. He went ape shit. I didn't say nothing. I didn't do anything except give a little bit of a leash correction, but not a pop. Just controlled him, stopped him from getting to that, and kept walking. That was it. All right. The dogs back up. And within a few seconds, they come and try to say hello again. And he erupts again. This went on for a few minutes, but each eruption got a little smaller. See, he didn't know anything else. He didn't know anything else. This is what he thought he was supposed to do. So by the time we got through my whole development, it used to take about 20 minutes to walk through my development. When we got back to the house, I let him off the leash. Let him off the leash. And he was fine. He was running around with the other dogs. Now, with that being said, there was always tension between him and Bruno, the Rottweiler. They did not like each other. As a matter of fact, they never liked each other till the day that German Shepherd died. But yet they never got into an argument or a fight ever. Not one time. They would lay in my backyard. I'd watch out the window. Yes, they were left alone all the time. And one, they'd lay close to each other. But one would face one way. One would face the other. They had no interest in each other. They, they, they really they didn't like each other. But yet they never got into a fight. And they would team up together. When I got Luca, you can imagine what kind of a pain in the ass he was. They would team up and work beautifully together to keep that dog under control and whoop his ass. I put a video out one time of them of them doing that. All right. But let me tell you, we'll go back to when I first brought him to the house. So he's running around free with them and he's fine. But you could tell there was tension between him and my Rottweiler. So when we first came into the house, I enter my garage, I go into my kitchen, that German Shepherd went and laid right in the corner of my kitchen, just lay down. As I'm walking through the kitchen, Bruno is walking with me, I see Bruno look over and glance at that Shepherd, okay? At that moment, I jumped all over Bruno. I jumped on him big time, and let, when I mean jump on him, I don't mean physically, okay? But I let him know I was unhappy with that decision. Because here's the deal, guys. Bruno has to know that he can't do that shit. So that's a challenge that he gave to that shepherd. He's letting that dog know, this is my house. You know, you don't belong here. He has to know he can't do that. And I have to let him know, you don't make the rules here, fucker. I do. I don't care how beautiful and how much I love you and how good of a dog you are. You don't set no boundaries here. I make all the rules. So I had to jump on him. Bruno had to see that. But more importantly... That shepherd had to see that he didn't have to worry about anything. I was going to take care of everything. Plain and simple. Okay, plain and simple. Never had a problem after that. With that being said, my dad used to feed that dog once a day. My dad would get home from work around 5 o'clock or so. He'd put his food down and Bear may pick at it here and there. You know, maybe 9, 10 o'clock, eat a little bit. We don't do that. My dogs eat twice a day. So you've heard me say before, you know, we don't accommodate our dogs. Our dogs have to accommodate us. So that first evening or morning, I, I don't know when we first fed him. You know, when that food went down, Bear walked up to his food. All other three dogs are eating, all in the kitchen, same place. And Bear sniffed his food and he walked away. 
And I said, okay, not a problem. I picked up the food. I put it away. Later on, 12 hours later, when it was time to eat again, I put his food down with everyone else's. He walked over, sniffed his food, walked away. I took his food, put his food away. Guess what? He didn't eat for three days. For three days, not a bite of food. But guess what? Day four, he ate. And he never missed a meal again. Plain and simple. So people get all worried. They start putting all kinds of good shit in their food. And they'll put chicken broth and steak and eggs. No, guys. Mother Nature is going to kick in. The dog's not going to starve to death. But we have to set those boundaries right away. Like, listen, buddy. You don't set the rules here. You're going to eat when the food goes down or you don't eat. That's it. Okay? Three days he didn't eat. He didn't die. He didn't get sick. You know, he'll be fine. Mother Nature kicks in and then he ate. And from that day on, he was as good as a dog as we ever had. Never had an issue with him. Beautiful, beautiful dog. You know, beautiful dog. In fact, he was Renzo's best friend. Renzo was two years old. His best buddy. They were inseparable. Back to Renzo. If, if that shepherd or my Rottweiler or any of the dogs were laying in the doorway of the kitchen, you know, my kids aren't allowed to step over them. We don't step over them. That dog has to move. That space is not the dog's. That space is ours. It's not a mean thing. When you ask the dogs to move, they don't get upset. You don't hurt their feelings. So at two years old, Renzo can walk up to either one of those dogs, both over 100 pounds, extremely powerful, and say, move and point, move. And the dog would get up and walk away, and he'd say, thank you. Thank you, Bear. Or thank you, Bruno. That was it. But you see, at two years old, he was able to do that. Very simple. A very powerful thing, guys, because that's how dogs operate. So we spend too much time trying to treat these dogs like they're children, like they're people, and it creates so many problems because the dogs don't understand that language. It provides a lot of confusion, and we get so many problems from that. But when there's a 130-pound Rottweiler or a German Shepherd laying there, and a two-year-old can walk up to him and say, move, please, and the dog gets him and goes, that's power. That's tremendous power, you know? And that's why my kids are so good with the dogs. You know, they have full control over my dogs, and that's a beautiful thing. But that comes from those little things that we establish inside the home from day one, okay? So we'll end this here. This is part two. We'll start part three here in a minute. Peace.